Hello and welcome to the Hanseatic League, a podcast by the History of the Germans. Episode 12. Money, money, money. Now, this was supposed to be an episode where we talk about the challenges the Hansa was facing after the victory over the Danes and the Peace of Stralsund, but that's not to be. Listeners Mehmet and Nina pointed out a few gaps in what I'd been talking about last week, and now these gaps need to be filled. It's all good talking about the trading network and the flow of goods across the Baltic and northern Germany, but what about the opposing flow? The flow of money. How do the merchants get paid? How can they transfer cash to pay for all the goods they, or their agents, are buying way down in Flanders and England? How do they cope with the sometimes erratic monetary policies of late medieval rulers? After all, it's money that makes the world go round. But before we start, let me thank all of you patrons and one-time supporters out there. I really, really appreciate that supporting a show you can listen to for free is an act of immense generosity. To say it with the author Roman Payne, of all public figures and benefactors of mankind, no one is loved by history more than the literary patron. Napoleon was just a general of forgotten battles, compared with a queen who paid for Shakespeare's meals and beer in the tavern. You see, there is a chance to outdo Napoleon for a mere two pounds a month, less than a chocolate croissant. All you have to do is go to patreon.com slash historyofthegermans or historyofthegermans.com slash support. And thanks so much to Mary Theresa H., Raphael F., David C. M., and Michael S., who've already signed up. Now, last week we talked about how the Hansa worked, or more precisely how current historians believe the Hansa worked. Because the interactions between merchants and the cities are so multifaceted that for the last 200 years each generation of writers picked elements of the story and wove it into their own narrative, curiously matching contemporaneous political and economic developments. So, for now, the prevailing story is that the Hansa was a complex network that allowed both information and trust to be exchanged, so that merchants could send bulky goods to exactly the right place at exactly the right time over vast distances. Each trader would have a number of associates in each of the main ports, and these associates would send not only the merchandises ordered, but also regular reports about the goings-on in their own location, as well as what they've heard from elsewhere. So these letters would contain things like Prices for squirrel pelts are up because winters come early. The abbot of the local monastery has decided to build a new church and needs wood and other building materials. Old Henry Warendorp had died and his company is being dissolved. People are gossiping that Jan de Waal is in financial trouble, etc, etc, etc. This information is crucial because the goods the Hansards traded in were usually bulky and meant for consumption. So once a ship full of grain had reached Bruges, the grain would have to be sold in Bruges, because shipping it elsewhere was very costly. Knowledge of the likely price this grain would fetch in Bruges made the difference between a handsome profit and a crippling loss. Now, having multiple associates in each city also kept one's business partners honest. The business community, even in a place like Lübeck, was still quite small, so that many people would know if a merchant was taking advantage of one of his partners abroad. Information about that would quickly find its way back to the injured party, who could take corrective action. Now, one success factor I had not mentioned last week, despite its crucial importance, was language. The Hansa merchants from Narva to Bruges, from Cologne to Bergen, all spoke the same language, Middle Low German. Now, Middle Low German has developed from Old Saxon, spoken in the Old Duchy of Saxony, and is most comparable to modern-day Dutch. This was the language not just spoken by the people, but also the written language. All those letters the merchants wrote to each other were written in Middle Low German, not in Latin. And this was a crucial advantage, as it meant business partners could understand each other across the whole of the Hanseatic world, along the 2,500 kilometers from Narva to Bruges and the 1,000 miles from Westphalia to Bergen. They held their court sessions in Middle Low German, and even the recesses of the Hanseatic Diet changed from Latin to Middle Low German in 1369. There were various dialects of Middle Low German, though Lübeck, thanks to its role within the Hansa, managed to dominate. So even the Scandinavian courts would maintain diplomatic communications in Lübeck dialect. Middle Low German was the lingua franca of Northern Europe. 
As it happened, that state of affair lasted only for a short period. By the 16th century, Low German was gradually replaced by High German, spoken by the Protestant preachers who used Luther's Bible. And this linguistic development mirrored the political development, as the largely separate history of the North we followed in the last 25 episodes was converging with the history of the South. Now, a tight network of traders who shared information, trust and a common language sounds very neat and efficient, leaving only one question. A question some of you have asked and I've clearly overlooked last week, which is, what about the money? Ah, such a grubby word. No honourable Hanseatic merchant would talk about money. Or as my grandfather used to say, money is no object since it's non-existent. And he wasn't so far off the truth. 14th century money bags had no money. At least, no ready cash. There weren't even any banks in the Hanse before two Florentines, Ludovici Baglioni and Gerardo Bueri, founded one in 1410. There were associates of the Medici, presumably sent out into this frontier market to test the waters. The waters proved to be rather cold, and the bank closed down when Bueri died in 1449. A few years later, a group of Hamburg merchants led by Godemann von Buren tried again, but that experiment also failed in 1472. After that, there were occasional attempts, including by associates of our friend Bernd Paul from Tallinn, to set up banking operations, but they never really gained much traction, and by the 16th century, the competition from southern Germany, from Nuremberg, Augsburg and Ravensburg, took charge of these activities. And moreover, the Hanseatic Diet banned merchants from borrowing on several occasions, namely in 1401, 1411, 1415, 1417, 1418, 1423, 1434 and 1447. Now does that mean the Hanse was some sort of commercial paradise of honest brokers who traded on fair terms and shunned excessive leverage, never touching that filthy lucre? Well, obviously not. They liked a bag of cash as much as the next man, they just did not think that Uncle Scrooge's money bin was the best way to manage wealth. Their wealth was in constant circulation. One of the reasons the merchants no longer travelled round with their goods, but had become fixed into a single location, was that it allowed for a much more efficient cash management. Goods they sent to one place were sold there and then turned into wares that would then travel to the next place where again they would be sold and replaced with something else. So, take our friend Bernd Pahl, the merchant from Tallinn we met last week. He had partners in Lübeck, Narva, Gdansk and Antwerp, but he himself mainly stayed in Tallinn. He would ask one of his associates to procure some furs from Novgorod via Narva. Those he had shipped to Lübeck where another associate would sell them on his behalf. The proceeds of that transaction would then be used to buy English cloth as per Bernd Pahl's instructions and then sent back to him in Tallinn. Meanwhile, he would do the same for his associates and partners who wanted to buy or sell goods in Tallinn. As a consequence, Bernd Pahl's warehouse was full of stuff belonging to his trading colleagues, whilst the goods he owned were in someone else's cellar. The same goes for the money. The money in Bernd's strongbox was mainly the proceeds of sales he had made on behalf of his business partners, Whilst again, money he owned was somewhere else in the network. A full reconciliation and payout only happened when Bernd Pahl died and his inheritance was settled. So, as long as these transactions operate on a bilateral basis, there is not much need for financial instruments. But the trade had grown a lot more sophisticated than that. Let's say Bernd Pahl wants to sell the furs to one of his associates in Lübeck but he does not trust that associate to get him a good deal on the English cloth. In that case, the money raised by selling the furs needs to go to the broker who will procure the cloth. The way to do that was a bill of exchange. So a bill of exchange works roughly as follows. Bernd Paar writes an instruction to his fur dealer to pay the cloth dealer the amount of 100 Lübeck Mark at Michaelmas. The document will be sent to the cloth dealer, who would then go to the fur dealer and ask him whether he would honour this instruction. If the fur dealer accepts this bill of exchange, he becomes the payor, meaning that at Michaelmas he has to pay the cloth dealer 100 Lübeck Mark, no ifs, no buts. Now the cloth dealer has a claim against the fur trader who lives in his town and who he could take to court if he fails to pay on time. 
there is a shortened court procedure for bills of exchange, meaning that he could send the bailiffs round in no time. And if the fur merchant is bankrupt, he could still claim the money back from Bernd Pahl. So from the cloth merchant's perspective, the bill of exchange is almost as good as cash, which means he is happy to find Bernd Pahl some English cloth and send it across to Tallinn. Bills of exchange are very common in the Hansa world, as it is in many other trading systems. What the Hansa merchants also use are bearer bonds, which are less common elsewhere. Now a bearer bond works as follows. Let's take again our friend Bernd Pahl in Tallinn. Assume he wants to buy English cloth for 200 Lübeck mark, but the fur he's sending is worth only 100 marks. He also does not have 100 marks in ready cash to send along with the furs to make up the difference. So what he can do is issue a document that says he would pay anyone who presented this document back to him the sum of 100 mark. This he sends to the cloth merchant together with a bill of exchange. Now the cloth merchant is a long-standing associate of Bernd Pahl, so he knows that Bernd is good for 100 marks. However, Mr. Cloth Merchant is unlikely to go to Tallinn any time soon to collect the 100 marks. That issue is overcome by the fact that Bernd Pahl promises to pay to whoever shows up with this bearer bond. So Cloth Merchant can take the bearer bond and swap it with someone else who needs to pay 100 marks in Tallinn. In return, he receives either the cash or another bearer bond or bill of exchange, for instance, so that he can pay the cloth merchants in London, where he gets his cloth from. Normally, bearer bonds do not work very well between individual merchants engaged in long-distance trading for the simple reason that they normally do not know each other very well. And more importantly, they have no current information about their creditworthiness. Now, in the Hansa, with its tight network of information exchange and social control, bearer bonds can work between individual merchants. Bills of exchange and bearer bonds are not only means to facilitate payments, but they also have a short-term credit element. So Bernd Pahl knows that it will take several weeks before the bearer bond he issued to pay for his cloth will make it back to Tallinn. The 100 marks he will need to pay out once the bond returns in, say, 6 or 8 weeks, he can use that to finance some short-term investment. In practice, that makes the bearer bond a short-term loan, and so is the bill of exchange. These instruments therefore cover a big part of the liquidity needs of a Hansa merchant. But there are financing needs that go beyond covering liquidity. For instance, our other Tallinn trader, the ambitious Hans Zellhorst, he needed to borrow money to buy himself a large and representative house in the center of town when he became a member of the Great Guild. Now the funds for that he seems to have borrowed from fellow merchants. So we find that some of the large merchants ran a financial business alongside their wholesale franchise. What they mostly did was extending credit to their suppliers or wares. So the burghers of Tallinn would, for instance, extend credit to the owners of the large Estonian estates, who were also their suppliers of grain and other agricultural produce. They would even lend large sums to bishops and the Teutonic Knights themselves. Now The reason for these loans were mainly to tie the suppliers to the traders. In Bergen, this was an integral part of the business model, as the Hansards linked their lending to the exclusive right to purchase the fishermen's catch at a predetermined price. Another major finance activity was money exchange. Currencies across the Baltic differed considerably. The silver mark of Lübeck was a key reference currency, but most of the large cities like Riga and Gdansk had their own currencies. The Scandinavian rulers as well as the German princes were minting coins and tried to enforce their use in the cities that belonged to their territories. Burgundy and England too had important currencies, which meant that traders were constantly obliged to use foreign exchange. To avoid having to ship vast amounts of gold and silver in various denominations around the place, a lot of this was done through bills of exchange. Say, Bernd Pahl in Tallinn would issue bills of exchange drawn on himself in Riga mark of silver. They could then be exchanged into bills of exchange drawn on Lübeck merchants in the mark of Lübeck at an agreed exchange rate. And that exchange rate was often used to hide the interest on the loan element of these instruments. Now, the people who would do these banking operations were Hanseatic merchants, rather than banks. Once a merchant has risen through the ranks and joined the city council, he will have to spend a lot of time on political issues, sometimes even go on long missions abroad. 
unless he has an excellent setup with a great apprentices or competent successor, it will be difficult for him to keep all these different balls in the air, making sure goods arrive on time, payments are made when due, etc. etc. That makes finance and real estate more attractive. Lending money or renting out houses requires less oversight and leaves room for political passions, which is why most creditors tended to be the most senior and the most powerful people in town. Bottom line, there was a lot of banking activity in the Hanse, just that it wasn't performed by banks. In the same way that the network system precluded the emergence of large trading firms, it also prevented the creation of large banks. In most markets, banks can offer loans on commercial terms superior to individuals, and that's down to three reasons. First, they can make a spread on the difference between the interest rate they pay on deposits and the interest they charge on loans. The second element is diversification. Banks have large portfolios of loans so that, if one borrower fails, the bank can sustain the loss. And third, at least in principle, banks should have superior information and sophisticated tools to assess the probability and the severity of default. Now, when the Hanse was at its height, none of these advantages cut through. Deposits were quite rare in a system where merchants kept running their business literally until they dropped dead and the cash was constantly in circulation. They effectively never really cashed out. Diversification too was of limited benefit, given that the market was comparatively small and major events such as wars or climate effects led to correlation between defaults. And finally, the network was a much more efficient information and risk mitigation model than a medieval banking house. On the other hand, when we come to the end markets of the Hanse in London and in Flanders, a banking model had a major advantage over individual merchants. And that's exactly where you find the great banking houses operating. You remember the victim of the privateer Paul Benecke, the banker Tommaso Portinari? Well, he was the main representative of the Medici Bank in Bruges. And these banks would offer loans secured by bonds or bills of exchange. For instance, it allowed a German merchant to use a bill of exchange drawn on another Hansard back in Hamburg to purchase goods from a Catalan. Now, the Catalan would not accept the bill of exchange on a guy he had never seen or heard of, but the bank would. We know from English records that the Hansa merchants were some of the most prolific users of lending services in 15th century London. One example of such heavy users of banking services was Hildebrand Weckinghusen. Now, the largest set of papers relating to the business of a Hansa family is the Weckinghusen archive, consisting of 12 account books and 600 letters, which are today part of the UN World Heritage. They trace the career of Hildebrand Weckinghusen, whose ambition exceeded many of his contemporaries. He had based himself in the Hanse contour in Bruges, from where he rapidly expanded, trading not just in the classic Hanseatic markets, but down into southern Germany and even into Venice. The scale of his business was impressive. In 1411 he claimed to have bought goods worth 70,000 ducats after having sold wares for 53,000 ducats. He traded in everything including luxury goods like amber from Prussia and furs from Novgorod. He also bought salt in vast quantities in the Bay of Bourneuf. To fund his expansion, he turned to Italian bankers. But he was just not lucky enough to play in that league. His associates lost goods and one defrauded him. The figs he ordered up from Italy arrived rotten, as did some rice. When the economy tanked in the early 15th century, leverage ended up biting him back and in 1422 he was arrested for not paying his bills and was put into the debtor's prison. All the way into the 20th century, historians had dismissed Weckinghusen as the exception that proves the rule. Hansard, so the story goes, were sober, calculating traders who refrained from speculation and excessive risk. In particular, Hansards allegedly did not like credit. In fact, they had it banned. And there were explicit decisions by the Hanseatic Diet banning the use of credit in, as I said before, 1401, 1411, 15, 17, 18, 23, 34 and 47. Does that mean the Hanse was opposed to lending in principle? Most people believed that until the 1980s, when Stuart Jenks took a close look at the background of these bans on borrowing issued in the early 15th century. What came out was a rather fascinating but extremely geeky story. 
So, if you're not particularly interested in the intersection of macroeconomics, finance, and politics in the 15th century, fast forward, wild guess, four to five minutes, and there we're going to talk about more accessible topics. So, this is now the story of the 1401 ban, which specifically applied to Bruges. At that time, Bruges, like the rest of Flanders, was part of the Duchy of Burgundy. The Duke of Burgundy was Philip the Bold, a man much engaged in war. As such, he was always short of gold, he needed to pay the troops. That seems surprising since he was the ruler of the most active commercial and financial markets in Northern Europe, Bruges, Ghent and Antwerp, and should hence be immensely rich. Now, being the overlord is great, but the problem was how to extract the money from the rich burghers of these cities. He could have increased taxes again, but that had been done already, Plus, it tended to affect the poor more than the rich, and these wretches had a tendency to revolt. If not by tolls and taxes, another way territorial lords funded themselves during this period was by manipulating the currency. These princes, like a state today, had the right to determine what was legal tender in their lands. Specifically, they could declare that new coins are being issued, and that everybody had to come and exchange their old coins for the new ones. The way the lord made money from that was by handing back a lot less gold or silver than he had received in the exchange. The victims of this cash extraction could only avoid a loss by two means. Either they melt their coins down and send them abroad, or they could simply hoard and hide them and wait for better days. Now, To prevent the former, the lord would issue a ban on all exports of gold, silver or coin upon severe punishment. Whether that works depends a lot on the prince's ability to enforce it. And quite frankly, a prince in the late Middle Ages did not have the means to check every transport of grain, cloth or wool for some gold ingots. Now, once the prince had gone through a couple of rounds of these kinds of devaluations, he finds himself confronted with a simple question. Is the reason that so few coins are presented at the mint down to either that there is no more gold left in the country at all, or is it down to the people hoarding precious metal? In 1399, the Duke of Burgundy came up with a way to find out. He ordered that from now on all transactions had to be made in cash. And that was a shock to the system. We may be in the early 15th century, but as we have seen with the bills of exchange and the bearer bonds, a lot of commercial transactions were already cashless. And that was even more the case in Bruges, the financial centre of Northern Europe. The citizens of Bruges were as unwilling to walk around with the equivalent of hundreds of thousands of pounds then as we would be today. Therefore, a merchant coming to Bruges would set up an account with a Bruges banker, often the host where he was staying at. This banker in turn had accounts with most other bankers in Bruges so that any transaction could be settled account to account. Alternatively, the parties could use bills of exchange, bearer bonds or banker's drafts. If the merchant was creditworthy, he may be even granted an overdraft on the account or could borrow funds to pay for the merchandise. That way, nobody ever saw any gold or silver coins. But the Duke was convinced they existed, based on the irrefutable evidence that these money bags seemed to be literally coining it. So, to lure out these elusive florins, livres, pounds and marks, the Duke made the city of Bruges demand that all transactions had to be done in cash. So, instead of handing over a bill of exchange in lieu of payment, the buyer would have to cash his paper and bring the coins to the seller. Or if the buyer was buying on credit, he needed to get the banker to give him the funds in coin and then hand them to the seller. At that point, it was now clear who had what coins at home and the Duke's men could come and demand them to be swapped into their inferior species. Somehow, that grand plan backfired, and badly. Somehow, this grand plan backfired, and badly. Because the Duke, great warrior that he was, he was no economist, let alone an expert in monetary policy. I guess nor are you, so let me take you through a little game. Imagine there was only one bank in the world with a capital of $100,000 and that is all the money that exists in the whole wide world. If I were the luckiest man in the world and was allowed to borrow these $100,000 from this bank, I would receive the $100,000 in cash from the bank. The bank now books a claim of $100,000 against me on their balance sheet. I take the $100,000 and I buy a house. 
The person I buy the house from receives the $100,000 in cash and puts it into his bank account with the same bank. The bank now has $100,000 in cash again and they can again lend it out. Now, if you are the second luckiest person in the world and allowed to take the $100,000 loan and buy a house, the same thing happens. The bank books another $100,000 loan as an asset on its books. The seller of the house puts the coins back in the bank so that there are now loans and deposits of $200,000 in the world. Well, the total number of coins and the total number of money is still only 100000 By 2023, we've gone through a couple of iterations of that process so that today the amount of total US dollar cash in circulation is about $2.4 trillion, and the paper amount, the so-called M2, is 10 times that. 21 trillion. Now, I think we can forgive our friend the Duke of Burgundy for not getting it. How could he have known that there was a whole wall of totally legitimate money without any coins? When he demanded settlement in cash for every credit transaction, bill of exchange, etc., the financial system in medieval Bruges went into meltdown. There was already so much more paper money than cash in circulation, there was no way this could be covered. Demand for coins went stratospheric and the nominal price of goods crashed. The idea of what happened when you do that? Google Plano Color, a more modern equivalent of a similar policy in Brazil in the 1990s. So, this is the background to the Hansa ban on borrowing. There's financial chaos in Bruges. Coins are hard to come by, which creates hyper-deflation. Merchants who bring in goods to Bruges will get paid a lot less for their goods than they had hoped for. At the Contour in Bruges, it's panic stations. Remember how the bill of exchange works. Our friend Bernd Pahl is sending beeswax to his partner in Bruges for sale, as well as a bearer bond, so that the company can buy some cloth. What he does not send is coins, silver or gold. His partner in Bruges now has a problem. He has to turn the beeswax and the bearer bond into local currency, and not just into money as an accounting measure, but into actual coins. Even if he managed to do that, the exchange rate is likely absolutely terrible. He then has to go and take the coins to buy the cloth. Cloth prices too have fallen thanks to the deflation, but that's unlikely to be enough to make up for what had been lost on the exchange rate. So that causes a heavy loss to Bernd Pahl, for which he's going to blame his partner. Now imagine if Bernd Pahl had issued his bill of exchange in local Bruges currency in Pound Grote. At that point, the associate in Bruges is really in the dumps. Either he accepts the bill of exchange and pays out the pounds groter, which means he takes a loss on the exchange rate, or he refuses the bill of exchange, at which point his own and Bernd Pals credit is destroyed. The merchants at the Contour in Bruges realize that something needs to be done, urgently. They need to stop this flow of bills of exchange and other credit instruments coming in from Cologne, Danzig, Riga or Lübeck, at least until this madness is over. The Contour writes to the Hanseatic Diet in Lübeck and asks for them to ban the use of credit in Flanders. Initially, the participants in the Diet did not quite understand why this was such a big issue, but in the second round they realized that they may lose either the Contour in Bruges or the good credit of the Hanse merchants in Flanders. So they reluctantly issued an order to block the issuance of credit. Now, once the madness was over, the ban was lifted again and things returned to normal. The Duke of Burgundy tried the same stunt again two or three times and the Hanseatic Diet responded again with a ban on the use of credit. These bans again were lifted once the issue was over. And that means the Hanse had no problem or objection to credit or cashless payments at all. They blocked its use in circumstances where princely shenanigans caused serious harm to some of the merchants. So, banking and the use of financial instruments was an integral part of the Hanseatic trade. There was nothing unusual about the way they operated. However, there was one significant difference between Hansards and their Italian, English, Flemish and Spanish counterparts. They did not use double bookkeeping. The trading records we have from this period suggest that accounting was a complete mess. A Hansard merchant literally had no idea whether his assets and liabilities were balanced nor did he have a reliable cash forecast. It often took years to work through the collection of letters and order books to reconcile the accounts of a company once one of the partners had left. Not knowing how much equity a business has is not something one would want to disclose to the bank when looking for a loan. 
That may be another reason that there were no banks and that the Hansa firms never grew to the size of a Fugger or Ravensburger. They simply could not handle it. I struggle to imagine how they even managed what they had. As we've seen with Bernd Paar, even relatively small merchants would be involved in three or four different companies whose goods and finances he had to keep separate from his own. Then some of his bills of exchange or bearer bonds were issued in his own name, some in the name of the company, or with different due dates. Cash had to be kept separate too and tracked. It really is mind-boggling. And finally, another point about currencies. Having all these different coins and frankly mad monetary policy must have been a major problem. A large part of banking in the Middle Ages was foreign exchange, either direct exchange of foreign coins into local currency or by issuing some sort of traveler checks which allowed the crusader or merchant to draw funds in lands far away. In both cases, the foreign exchange banker would make a handsome profit. This made trade more expensive than strictly necessary, which is why the Hansa tried to resolve the problem. Many cities had acquired the right to coinage during the 12th and 13th century. And the cities did not try to turn their currency into money-making schemes, the way the Dukes of Burgundy and pretty much all the other princes were doing. They wanted their currency to remain stable. So cities would form currency clubs, which attempted to regulate the quality of the coinage. The most important one was the Münzverein of the Wendish cities that was formed immediately after the Peace of Stralsund and included Lübeck, Hamburg, Wismar and Lüneburg, as well as a number of associated members. They committed to rules about the minimum silver content in the mark, they had ordinances about how the mint and its personnel was to be run, and they would procure the precious metal together from Bohemia. This did help a bit, but... Even within this club, discipline was sometimes lax, and it took until the 16th century before they issued the first joint coin, a large silver one mark containing 18 grams of sterling silver. A stable currency would have been a huge benefit to the Hanseatic League and Northern and Eastern Europe in general. But the currency clubs operated outside the context of the Hanseatic diets, which did slow down the financial integration across the association, that there never was a common currency across the region. How important this could be is shown by the example of England, the great rival of the League in the 15th century and the emerging world trading power. England had one currency, pound sterling, that was legal tender across a sizable territory and, most importantly, could not be used as an ATM for the royal purse. Since the 12th century, the quality of the English coins is checked every year by the Chancellor of the Exchequer, some financial leaders, the representatives of the Royal Mint and the worshipful company of goldsmiths in a process that's called the Trial of the Picks. This is not a joke. The process still happens every year and once the Assay Office has confirmed the accuracy of the coins, the verdict is read out by the clerk of the goldsmiths company on behalf of the Senior Master and King's Remembrancer, a title going back to 1154 only in England. Which is where we'll be going next week. We are now in the period where the Hansa begins to notice the unintended consequences of its success in the war with Denmark. Taking control of the herring market in Scania and banning the Dutch and the English from access sets off a sequence of events that turns the great victory into a smouldering calamity. I hope you'll join us again next week. Now, before I go... Just a big thank you to all of my patrons who kindly keep this show on the road. I really, really appreciate your generosity. And if you want to join, there's still a chance to grab one of the Patreon subscriptions at patreon.com slash historyofthegermans or at historyofthegermans.com slash support. And finally, bibliography. This episode relied heavily on Carsten Janke, Die Hanse, Carsten Janke, Netzwerke im Handel und Kommunikation an der Wende vom 15. zum 16. Jahrhundert and Stuart Yanks war die Hanse kreditfeindlich.